Uh, Tyler was born and raised in Providence, Utah, in the beautiful Cache Valley. After a serving a mission in Brazil, he returned home and married an angel named Kiplin Crook. They have 10 children, five boys and five girls. He spent the next seven years teaching at the Logan LDS Institute adjacent to Utah State University. One of his assignments there was working in the seminary pre-service program, teaching and training potential seminary teachers. He has piloted and managed the launch of the online seminary program, has taught here at BYU since August 2010, and I should point out here, Tyler and I came to BYU at the same time, and in fact, we're just uh, two doors away, and it's really a privilege, I consider it a great privilege to be here, um, can be considered a, a colleague of Tyler's. Um, he is a co-founder of the BYU Virtual Scriptures Group, which works to uh, develop digital learning resources to enhance scriptural immersion and understanding. And his bachelor's degree was in electrical engineering, and his master's and doctorate degrees are both in instructional technology. So without any further ado, I will now turn the podium over to Tyler. Thank you, Lincoln. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. Anybody who would like to dedicate my grave at this point, I'd, I'd be fine. Thanks. Today, we get to dive into Matthew. Brothers and sisters, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander a little bit. Um, there's, there's this interesting thing that occurs whenever you dive deeply into scripture study. If you're not too careful, then you can end up going to one extreme or another of a pendulum swing. The one swing would be you can get so focused on the history on the, the culture, the context, the language, the setting, that that's all you see. And so you become a left brain expert in all things historical. The other pendulum swing is you don't really care what it really meant back then. You only look at what it means for us today. And so you're only looking for applications, which at times could be helpful, but at other times that application might be built on a very sandy foundation because it has nothing to do with, with what Jesus was actually teaching, for instance. So our, our struggle as uh, students of the scriptures in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to say, how can we find a balance between those two? How can we go back in time and understand enough of the history, culture, context, language, setting, to be able to understand what's going on there and then bridge the gap between his story and our story? Got it? So we're going to try to find a balance between both as we go through and look very closely at Matthew and his unique perspective of who Jesus is. So it's kind of interesting because Mark, by most scholars' uh, opinions, Mark was written first. His was the, the premier gospel. Matthew and Luke use Mark as kind of source material as well as some other things to write their gospel second. So then the question begs asking, what's Matthew doing first in our New Testament? It should have been Mark. He wrote his first. And he is, uh, he's the least unique because Matthew and Luke stole much of his stuff, so to speak. So why isn't he first? Well, it's interesting. If you look closely at Matthew, his gospel is the most natural bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament on many, many, many levels, not just a few. He is showing how God brought salvation to the people in the Old Testament and then bridging that gap with how God brings salvation to the people in the New Testament, way better than Mark does. Um, here's the question, brothers and sisters. If you compare the old with the new and Matthew providing us this nice little bridge, then the question for us in the modern day would be, what could I do to follow Matthew's example and be a bridge between the old and the new? Whether it be talking about home teaching and visiting teaching as the old, ministering as the new. Whether it be the Mormon church as the old, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the new, what our prophet is asking us to do. How can we bridge the gap between what used to be done and what is now needing to be done to move the work forward and accelerate it? Um, some wonder, by the way, 
why should we even focus on any of the individual authors? Why not just remain in a harmony look at the Gospels? Just focus only on Jesus. That's a valid question. And there's great power in just focusing on Jesus. However, stop and think about this for a minute. The more you understand a particular lens, then the more you'll understand what that lens is showing to you. You'll understand the perspective that lens is trying to give you. And if you can see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as four distinct individual testifiers of Jesus Christ who focus on different things at different times for different purposes, then you can get to know better what their message about Jesus is. And brothers and sisters, this is not too different or distinct from your relationships today. If you really get to know people, what they're like, what their intent is, then you're gonna be able to make a lot better sense of what they're saying and why they do the things they do and, and how they're living their life, so to speak. So as we dive in today, we're gonna try to get a better look at Matthew. Um, his lens first, his audience, and then his unique testimony of Jesus Christ. It's powerful, okay? So Matthew is by far and away the most Jewish of any of the, the four gospels in its nature. He has over 60 quotations from the Old Testament, more than twice, than two, two times more than any of the other gospel writers. He is spending so much time in that Old Testament, which tells us something about his audience. He's clearly at the center of his audience is clearly this big Jewish population. Now, we're gonna talk about some Gentiles in his audience in a minute, so hold that thought. It's not exclusively Jewish, but for a, a Jew in the first century, keep in mind, we sometimes forget the fact that the early Christian church, they don't see themselves as early Christians. They see themselves as a sect of Jewish, the, the Jewish religion of the, of the day, of Judaism. They're just a break off of Judaism. They don't see themselves as this brand new thing yet. That doesn't develop until over time where there's this clear dividing line. So Matthew is writing to these Jewish Christians trying to convince them that Jesus is the Christ. And the way you do that with good practicing Jews is show them how Jesus fulfills all of these Old Testament prophecies and stories and symbols. And you're gonna be connecting him all the time back to the key figures in the Old Testament. Matthew does that better than any of the other gospels because that's his audience. He will in fact take 13 exact quotes from the Old Testament and say something like, Thus it is fulfilled, when Jesus did this, this scripture is now fulfilled, and he'll show it in, in his gospel. Let me, let me uh, turn with you. If you have your scriptures, join me. Let's have fun. Go with me to his very first, what we call formula quotation, where he does this with an Old Testament passage. I want to show you something kind of cool. It's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Listen carefully. Here's what he says. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, and the prophet here is Isaiah. You ready? Verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. For Matthew, he know, he's aware of the fact that many people have interpreted Isaiah 7 many ways about different people being this Emmanuel. But for Matthew, Emmanuel is being fulfilled in the birth, the divine birth of one person and one person alone for Matthew's perspective, and that's Jesus Christ. So here's the cool thing. He calls him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Notice that his first formula quotation refers to the fact that God is gonna come down and be with us. And if you just turn over to the very, very last verse of the Gospel of Matthew, listen, what do you notice? Very last verse. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Amen. 
Brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't think Matthew just happened to write that down without realizing that he just basically put the name Emmanuel in word form with Jesus's parting statement before his ascension that we don't even get an ascension account in Matthew's gospel. He gave you this bookend. I am with you always. We add the S as opposed to the King James translators here. I'm with you always. So God with us in the birth and at the very end of his life, I'm with you always. Brothers and sisters, everything in the book of Matthew shows you how God is in the flesh with us and this book is messy. There are a lot of muddy things. There are a lot of difficulties and trials and tribulations and storms and death and despair and pain and anguish. Matthew's overarching message for me is God's with us. We're in the boat with him. He's with us and he will be with us always. Now, here's the neat thing for me. You see, we could get so excited about history and about Matthew's audience in the first century that that's all we talk about. The cool thing for me is when you understand the history and the, and the setting and the audience, then it makes it easier to appropriately apply it to us today. Brothers and sisters, it has never been more applicable than it is in our world today that God is going to be with us always through the life and mission and perfection and grace and mercy of his son, Jesus Christ. That statement at the end of Matthew is just as applicable to us as it was to his audience 2,000 years ago, halfway around the world. It's still alive and well, and it's still applicable. So we can, we can dive in now to this book, not thinking, okay, let's study history and leave it there, but let's study history so that we can better understand our story, okay? Can I get an amen? That doesn't mean it's the end. I just, a little evangelical flair here. Okay, um, here's, the, here's the interesting side note. Knowing that Matthew's trying to convince predominantly a Jewish audience that Jesus is the Christ, you would expect him to be very favorable towards the Jews. You'll notice how careful we have to be when we, when we put labels on people or on groups. You can say the Jews and it just lumps this big group in. Would the Pharisees and the Sadducees love being lumped together back in the first century? No, they're, they're not friends. The only thing that unites the Pharisees and Sadducees is what? Their hatred of Jesus. That's the only thing that seems to bring them together. But to give this big label and just call it the Jews all the time without qualifying, what do we mean? It's really difficult. Matthew is more harsh against the leaders of the Jews than anybody. Now, John will give you lots and lots of arguments and confrontation with the leaders of the Jews, but Matthew gives this scathing rebuke in Matthew 23, where he's just, there is no holding back, and Jesus is just rebuking them openly. But he's not rebuking the Jews. He's rebuking the leaders of the Jews. It's really important that we keep that in mind when the Book of Mormon refers to the Jews, that we don't just lump all Jews together, but we understand, oh, it's probably the leaders, the chief priests, the ones who are doing this rather than the laity, the majority of the people. Keep in mind, Matthew is a Jew. John, Peter, Jesus, they're all Jews. Mary, Mary Magdalene, they're all Jews. So it's not the Jews per se, it's the leaders of the Jews who Matthew is gonna allow Jesus to go after in his lens that he's showing us. And in chapter 24 of Matthew, you're gonna get incredible judgments and uh, prophecies of, of destruction, okay? The other thing to notice, brothers and sisters, we often will speak down to the law of Moses. We'll sp speak ill of it. You'll notice Matthew, speaking to a Jewish audience, never says one bad thing about the law of Moses. He doesn't downplay the law of Moses. He doesn't feel like he has to belittle the law of Moses in order to elevate the law of the gospel as taught by Jesus in the New Testament. He doesn't have to do that. And yet we sometimes in our, in our zeal for a certain doctrine or practice or philosophy today, we, or 
or like for one individual, we feel like we have to tear somebody or something else or some other doctrine down in order to lift this one up. I love Matthew's example here. He doesn't do that. Jesus always upholds and fulfills the law of Moses in the Gospel of Matthew. He'll never, he'll never speak ill of it. In fact, in fact, there's this neat little pattern that emerges. Every time somebody comes tempting Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, trying to trap him, trying to back him into a corner, trying to make him look dumb or like they're superior, every time Jesus will turn to them and he will respond to their question, respond to their trap simply by turning them back to the Old Testament, back to the law of Moses. He'll refer them back there. He will not give them the higher law. They're not ready for it. And then he'll often, after diffusing them and sending them back to the law of Moses to say, you, you need to go and read the law. What does it say in the Old Testament? Then he'll often turn to his disciples and end up doing something like telling a parable to teach the higher law in code. So they don't get it, but disciples then and now can see how to really answer this issue at a higher level rather than going back to the law of Moses. In fact, um, his, his uh, law of Moses issues, let, let, me, let me show you some examples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these out of the chapter in the book. Um, listen to this. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. That's clearly a law of Moses, Moses statement that Jesus is re-enthroning for his, for his audience there. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would resonate with the Jewish audience. Jesus facilitates Peter to go pay the temple tax with the fishing experience, with the hook. Takes out the fish. He clearly has a Tyrian shekel in his mouth. He can pay the temple tribute tax of a half shekel each for Peter and Jesus, which, by the way, is one of those often overlooked miracles that is so beautiful with atonement symbolism. Jesus pays a price he didn't owe. And in the process, he's also paying a debt that we can't pay. Now, you could argue Peter could come up with a half shekel to pay that, but a really small symbolic level, that's a beautiful symbolism foreshadowing the infinite sacrifice that Jesus is going to pay for us. Another example, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He's even upholding with that one some of the tradition of the priests that pray that your flight isn't on the Sabbath day because you have very strict rules about how many feet you can walk on the Sabbath day. Um, it's also interesting because it's, it's unique in Matthew's gospel because of his audience that Jesus is never once accused by the chief priests of breaking the law of Moses himself. They only ever confront Jesus because he lets his apostles and disciples break their traditions. Things like plucking grain on the Sabbath, eating with unwashed hands, not fasting, etc. They never call Jesus on the carpet with those things, but they always get in debate with him over letting his disciples do that. So, um, listen very carefully. Luke's sermon on the plain, which is the equivalent to the Sermon on the Mount, but a much smaller, simplified version, he never emphasizes, Luke never emphasizes the importance of the law, doesn't even bring it up, doesn't care. In his lens, his view of Jesus, that's not important. But in Matthew's, it's essential. Listen carefully. Out of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, he says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, if we're not careful, we will fall into what might be called a rabbinical trap here, where you pick your favorite gospel writer and that's all you look at. That's the only lens you look at Jesus through. And Jesus becomes just that. Let me give you an example. Some would prefer to say, well, let's just, let's just study Jesus through the lens of John and Luke. John, because it's just the gospel of John. You gotta love John. And Luke, because Jesus is so kind and compassionate and healing. 
and taking care of all these people on the margins that are getting forgotten by everybody else, but Luke focuses on them, and we just, it just makes us feel good. And Luke never emphasizes the law or the keeping of commandments to the same degree. So if you're not careful, you will put Jesus in a box defined by only Luke and John. The incredible thing is, is it's really hard to put Jesus in a box. He's, uh, to use C.S. Lewis, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is not a tame lion. Jesus is not a tame God, and you can't put him in boxes. So it's fascinating when you combine Luke's perspective with John's perspective. So you take this loving and kind and powerful, and then you add this law-keeping, law-fulfilling. If, if, you, if you leave Matthew out, then you're saying, you're right. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And it'll be well with us. God will just love us and hug us into heaven, which ties into a, another C.S. Lewis concept where he said, unfortunately, many disciples today don't want a father in heaven. They want a grandfather in heaven. There, there. Look at the little children. Just let them have their fun. You get the idea. So let's be careful that we bring all of the perspectives in, including Matthew's powerful testimony that the fulfilling and the keeping of law is essential to Jesus. Therefore, it should be essential to us and not treated as if it were a second uh, rate citizen in the scriptural canon. Okay, now I said that I was going to include a few things regarding Gentiles. Isn't it neat, brothers and sisters, that in that early Christian church, that early movement, you had all of your earliest Christians were Jewish. So all those converts are all Jewish. And then as Cornelius and others start joining the church, now you get this group of Gentiles that are Gentile Christians. And these Gentile Christians often probably were made to feel in most of the congregations like they were on the outside looking in, even though they were Christians, because they were lesser, because, because for 1,500 years, the promises of salvation have been exclusive for the house of Israel. And the Gentiles have been totally excluded, seen as, as unclean, filthy. You don't interact with them unless you absolutely have to. And now, all of a sudden, Jesus having fulfilled all the law, his final invitation to the apostles is go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, this inclusive nature of the gospel, brothers and sisters, that you can see in history, I hope you can see it today. I hope you can see that as we move forward in time, what's happening with revelations through our current prophets and apostles. The gates of heaven are opening wider and wider and wider to invite all to come unto Christ, all to partake of, of his goodness and of his love. Um, and this is powerful as you see Matthew reaching out to some Gentiles in his book, things like the Magi in chapter two, Gentiles who recognize that Jesus is the Christ. They get major airtime. Like the uh, centurion at the crucifixion. Surely, this was the son of God. Here's this Gentile who recognizes Jesus' divinity. Um, and then his final directive to take the gospel to every creature. So you can see Matthew with mainly a predominant Jewish audience with a few Gentiles on the fringe that he's trying to pull in to say, Jesus is the Christ. You can all be uh, sure of that, okay? Now, let's begin with his birth narrative. So Matthew, unlike Mark, you'll notice with Mark, his chapter begins, his book begins at the baptism. Jesus is 30. Boom, and right out of the chute, Jesus is being baptized, and what do you hear God say? He says, thou art my beloved son. Now, you might think to yourself, well, cool. What's the difference between God saying to Jesus, thou art my beloved son, and what he's recorded as saying in the Gospel of Matthew at the baptism? This is my beloved son. Are you seeing that there could be potential difference between declaring, I'm going to claim you as my son, is how it comes across. So since this is a symposium on Christology, one of the Christologies is called the adoptionist Christology. 
So an adoptionist Christology believes or teaches that Jesus was born fully mortal. He's the son, you might even call him the illegitimate son of Joseph and Mary, who's fully mortal, but he's so good at keeping the law that by the time he gets to be 30, God up in heaven's looking down at all the world saying, that's the one I'm going to adopt as my own. And so at his baptism, he says, thou art my son. And from here on out, Jesus is the adopted son of God. So some people, if all they had were the Gospel of Mark, that's where that adoptionist Christology thought comes from. Matthew takes that completely off the table and says, no, no. We're going to start our record, not at his baptism, but with a divine account of his miraculous conception and birth. So he adds these two chapters at the front that Mark doesn't add. And Luke does the same thing. He adds a birth narrative, but it's fascinating because Luke's birth narrative is focused mostly on the story from Mary's perspective. Matthew's is focused mostly from Joseph's perspective. Now, some of you might be sitting here thinking, why should I care? Well, if your audience is predominantly Jewish, which gender are you going to focus on if you're trying to convince them? You're going to focus on the masculine side because David is critical in this equation and Joseph is a son of David. Go with me to chapter 1 of Matthew. Let's begin here. Let's look at the chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you get the three titles, okay? Christ, Christos, the anointed one, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. And then Matthew does this funny little thing. He takes the genealogy of Joseph, and he divides it neatly into 14, 14, and 14. Brothers and sisters, we're not even covering the same time, meaning we are skipping major generations here because he's taking you from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, on down until he gets to David, and he's saying, There's four, there are 14 generations. That just covered 750 years. You're not going to cover 750 years with 14 generations. So he's skipping people to get to this magic number 14. And then he goes from David down to the Babylonian exile. There's 14. Well, that's 450 years. And then he takes you from the Babylonian exile down to Jesus himself. There's 14. And you sitting here in 2018 are thinking to yourself, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for dividing Jesus' genealogy for me into three sets of 14. That means absolutely nothing to me in the modern world. You see the difference between these pendulum swings? If all you focus on is how can we apply this, and we spend tons of time in our teaching setting saying, what do you think that means? Well, people can talk about what they think it means till the cows come home and walk away from the discussion, probably none the wiser, just spending a ton of time. But if you dive into history and you say, hmm, what did the number 14 mean as seen through Matthew's lens to his audience, all of a sudden things start opening up. There's this funny little uh, thing that they do in antiquity. It's got a couple of names. One of them is Gematria, where they will take your name in Hebrew letters. And since in Hebrew, you don't do vowels, you don't write the vowels, you just write the consonants. Every one of the 22 um, letters in the Hebrew alphabet have a value as associated with them. Aleph is one, Beit is two, on up, you've got your 22 letters, and they, they spread them out so you can get big numbers. It's a very common practice. You would take your name and you could associate a number with it. Just take a stab in the dark guess. Whose name do you think is associated with the number 14? See, everybody would probably initially guess Jesus. It's actually the most frequently named person in the entire Bible. 1,085 references to this guy, and he is the Jewish audience's hero. His name is David, David. DVD in English, Dalit Vav Dalit in the Hebrew. Dalit is the fourth letter, Vav is the sixth letter, Dalit is the fourth. Four plus six plus four equals 14. Everybody in Matthew's audience, when they see 14, instantly they translate 14 into David. This is David. 
And if you repeat something three times, it's one of the many ways that you can add this supreme emphasis to a, to a concept, to a word, to a thing. And so what Matthew just did to his Hebrew audience is he said, Jesus is the son of David, the son of David, the son of David. He is the superlative son of David. Now, you're still sitting here probably thinking, why should we care if he's the superlative son of David? It's because David, with all of his problems later on with Bathsheba, he continued to try to remain faithful even after that and got some promises from the Lord recorded in 2 Samuel where God promised him that through his seed, there would be a Davidic king rise up and restore the kingdom again. And it has been prophesied and they are for, since 1000 BC and they are holding on to it. And then the Babylonian exile took place and they're like, oh, it didn't get fulfilled. Then we come back from exile in the 530s BC and they have been watching and watching and watching and waiting. Where is our son of David? who's gonna restore the kingdom to the Davidic throne. So Matthew comes along and he's like, ah, we've got him, he's here. Son of David, son of David, son of David. This is the one. Now, brothers and sisters, to take this one step further, Matthew at the beginning is gonna emphasize the son of David and right at the end of his life again, he's gonna emphasize it better than any of the other gospel writers with the event called the triumphal entry. Some of you may not remember this story well, but when David was ready to die, somebody was trying to take his throne from him and be anointed a king, and Bathsheba came and told him. So David, on his deathbed, says, go, take my son Solomon, take him to the Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley, there anoint him to be a king, anointed, a Christos, a Messiah, a Mashiach, a Messiah, anoint my son Solomon, put him on my mule, march him down the Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem triumphantly to be the king, the son of David. That's all in 1 Kings chapter 1. So isn't it interesting when Jesus gets on a donkey or a mule, rides down the Kidron Valley past the Gihon Spring, what does the whole crowd start shouting? Hosanna, which means Dear God, save us now. Uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be he who cometh in the name of the Lord. This is him. This is the son of David, the Davidic king. And they probably all expect him to come in and do what? Restore the kingdom to Israel. And they didn't expect him to come in and uh, have major, major struggles and run-ins with the Sanhedrin and the chief priests of the people. They wanted him to overthrow Rome and all the kingdoms of the world. Brothers and sisters, that little passage right there is loaded because what the Jews are chanting and singing and shouting, this Hosanna, it comes out of Psalm 118. If you go with me, if you have your scriptures, this is worth marking. Trust me on this one. Go to Psalm 118. Listen carefully to Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now. Well, what is that? Hosanna. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity, and now the famous 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And you're thinking, wow, so why should I care, Brother Griffin? What's the big deal with this? Well, Psalm 118 forms a part of the great Hallel, which is Psalm 113 through 118 combined with 136. These are the praise. H Hallel means praise. That's why when you say hallelujah, Hallel to Yah, Yahweh, it's praise Jehovah. That's what hallelujah means. So the Hallel hymns are sung in praise at festival times of year and at these big, glorious, wonderful times of year or in preparation for the coming of the promised Messiah. And the Jews in the Kidron Valley and in Jerusalem that day are seeing, oh, this is it, this is it. This is the arrival of our Messiah. He's here, our Davidic King, and they're singing this Hallel to him. Now, the haunting symbolism in Psalm 118, 
is that the hello, uh, the, the praise verses here are bracketed. Look in Psalm 118, verse 22. This is hauntingly beautiful. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Before we even get to the praise, we're going to talk about, oh, the stone first is going to be refused by the builders. And then afterward, it will become the chief cornerstone. But it first has to be rejected. No, this isn't worthy. And then right after the great praise, listen to this. This one's painful. 27. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. I don't think this is all lost to Matthew nor his audience, but sometimes we miss it in our modern reading because we just fly through the black words on the white page. But if you go back in their culture, their context, I think Matthew is preparing his audience to understand how Jesus could go from a royal Christology, a kingly fulfillment of all of this Davidic prophecy and transition into atonement Christology, an offering of a sacrifice of the suffering servant kind of Christology. Does that make sense? So, um, beautiful symbolisms that the audience in the first century would have loved and, and understood, but we have to dig out a little bit more, okay? Now, let's go to back to Matthew chapter 1. I need to say one other thing about this genealogy pedigree chart. Brothers and sisters, Matthew is speaking to a Jewish audience dominated by men, and in his pedigree chart, he puts five women among the 14, 14, and 14 men. He puts five women. If it were telling wonderful stories about the women, that would be in Luke's gospel, not in Matthew's. It's interesting to see who the five women are, Mary being the final one, but four others from the Old Testament. You have Tamar. If you know the story of Tamar and Judah, it's not a great story. You've got uh, Rahab. You've got Ruth, and you've got Bathsheba. In every case, to a Jewish audience in the first century, they would see those four names, and in every case, they would think uh, unrighteous, uh, unholy, Gentile, unclean. Their, their pure Jewish instinct would be to judge harshly all of these women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, because the baby in Matthew's account is clearly not Joseph's. All five of these women would have been marginalized by their society in Matthew's audience. And I love the fact that Matthew puts them in there because we should stop marginalizing them and stop marginalizing people today because of this, but to find ways to say, look, we're talking about progenitors of the Son of God here. And these are, these are ancestors of Jesus. And I love that. I love that Matthew was able to include that so that we can stop pushing them into the, into the uh, fringes of our scripture page and say, isn't it amazing what God is able to uh, redeem all of mankind, okay? Now, let's shift um, to verse 21. Last thing in the birth narrative, and then we're going to get further into the book, I promise. We've got 10 minutes, and we haven't even gotten out of the birth narrative here. Um, Look at verse 21. This is spoken to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, that makes no sense in English. Joseph, you need to name Jesus, the, the baby Jesus. Take him as your own. And if you're naming him, that means you're adopting him. So Joseph, your pedigree, your son of David, which he's referred to, is now going to be Jesus's. Because under a Jewish context, that's all that matters. They're following the male line, the, the patrilineal line. But Joseph, you need to name him. It's really important that he get the name Jesus. Keep in mind, Jesus is an English word. That is not what Jesus was called. Nor was he called by the Greek name Jesus. He was called the name Yehoshua or Yeshua. Well, in English, the word Jesus doesn't have anything to do with saving people by its, by its etymology. And in Greek, Jesus doesn't have anything to do with saving people. But in Hebrew, 
Yehoshua is the root for Jehovah and Shua saves. Salvation is of Jehovah. Jehovah saves. Joseph, it's really important. So Jesus walking the streets wouldn't have been called Jesus. He would have been called uh, Yehoshua or Yeshua, which means Jehovah saves his people. That's his name. So Joseph, it's very important you give him that name because that's who he is and that's what he's going to do. And to Matthew's audience, that's a big deal to see that, that allusion to everything at the, in the story keeps pointing us back to the end of the book of what Jesus is actually going to do. Now, um, the new Moses. To Matthew's audience, way more than Luke's or Mark's or John's, it is essential that they understand a connection also with their favorite lawgiver prophet of the Old Testament. We've talked about how much they love David. Let's talk about Moses. They want him to be the new Moses. So let me just walk you through a couple of these. Think about Matthew's perspective as he's telling Jesus' story. Both Jesus and Moses had kind of unique infancies and childhoods. Both were born into poor families who were part of a conquered people. In fact, that's the point in the Old Testament where the most famous female money manager was mentioned. Are you all aware of this? Yeah, it was Pharaoh's daughter. Times were really rough. She went down to the bank of the Nile and she drew out a prophet. Just, just so you know, that's what happened. Some are getting a little sleepy, so I had to wake you up, sorry. Um, both babies were spared from infanticide while many around them died. Both were raised by a stepfather. In an inverse connection, Moses was born as a slave, then became a prince. Jesus was born king of the Jews, but became the ultimate slave, the infinite servant of all. Neither Jesus nor Moses seem to have a permanent home, permanent dwelling. They don't seem to be able to put the roots down really deeply for too long. Um, there's also symbolic connection with Moses' miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. By the way, do you know who the first prophet to go through the MTC was? Yeah, it was Moses. He's one of the only prophets who ever got to go through a sea that was empty. Just making sure you're awake out there, teaching the doctrine here. Um, you'll notice, brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't go through an empty sea. He went through a sea by walking on it, not by emptying it. Um, after leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses, Moses fasted for 40 days while on Mount Sinai. Jesus fasted for 40 days out in the wilderness. They both had divine interactions with God on the mountaintop under the thick cover of clouds in the Mount of Transfiguration and on Mount Sinai, resulting in shining faces for both. Heavenly bread, miraculous loaves were provided in abundance for both Moses' and Jesus' followers. Matthew is the one who's emphasizing all of these Moses connections in his gospel. You'll get bits and pieces of them in the other gospels, but it's Matthew who doesn't, if there's a connection with Moses, Matthew's mentioning it. He's bringing it up, but he doesn't inherently connect them because to his people, they're going to be making the connections automatically. Um, like Moses and uh, Jesus also instituted a richly symbolic meal for his people, Passover replaced by sacrament that's going to be perpetuated through, through time. Um, isn't that interesting that for us in the restored Church of Jesus Christ, with the addition of the Book of Moses, after being in the wilderness with God, Moses sees Satan and tries three times to cast him out, and it doesn't work. A superlative failure to cast out Satan using his own power alone. Jesus spends time in the wilderness with God and on his way home is confronted by Satan three times and casts him out all three times. I think there's an unwritten message for us. We're not going to cast Satan out on our own. We have to have his help. He's superlatively good at doing this. And on and on it goes with Moses. Um, Moses is famous for his five books. So what does Matthew do? It's almost like he purposefully divides his gospel into five segments each with five sermons to pattern and mirror Moses's five books, the law. Moses gave the, the new law from God on a mountain. So where does Matthew take Jesus to give his higher law? We call it the Sermon on the Mount. 
as opposed to Luke, Sermon on the Plain. You get the idea. It's for Matthew, he's trying to convince his people, see, Jesus is the new Moses. He's not just the son of David, he's also the new Moses and the son of Abraham. You could have fun going through Abraham's life and Jesus' life, finding comparisons. Now, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, the real trick is, can you go through your own life and compare it with Jesus' life and find comparisons? Because if we can't, then we're probably not trying very hard to emulate him yet. And, and it doesn't mean we have to have all these big events that, that match up perfectly. It's just that we're trying to be like Jesus. So you're going to find more connecting points with him, like you can see here. Now, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to skip to the end. And I'm going to go to something um, with two quick stories from the end of the book of Matthew with the crucifixion and the atoning sacrifice portion. Um, if you go to the part where Jesus is on the cross and he dies, it says in Matthew 27, verse 51, and by the way, Matthew's not the only one to mention this, but Matthew's audience might have gotten more out of this than the other audiences in the first century because it says, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Notice this, we often overlook this part. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Brothers and sisters, 60 feet up, nobody's climbing a ladder and ripping this thing from the top to the bottom. Matthew's pointing out the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom, which means the rending was initiated from on high. God ripped this veil, or Jesus as he's dying, he's the one ripping the veil, one or the other, it doesn't matter but it's a heavenly ripping. It's not an earthly ripping from the bottom to the top. Now there have been, there has been so much ink spilled on this particular topic and it's beautiful, it's all wonderful because you have layer upon layer upon layer of possible interpretations of what does that mean? This veil got ripped. One uh, biblical scholar has listed 35 potential interpretations for what that means and all of them are pretty much good at one level or another. But there's one of those layers that might have meant a little bit more to Matthew's Jewish audience in the first century. Jewish people, Jewish fathers, when they find out of a tragic event in their family, like a son dying or a son suffering and then dying, what's the first thing a Jewish father will do? He'll reach up and he'll rip, rend his, his garment, rip his shirt, revealing his bosom, Here's this Holy of Holies, brothers and sisters, that only one high priest once a year on Yom Kippur in the fall gets to go in one occasion and then quickly get back out. And nobody ever gets to go in again until the next year when he'll go in again. One person once a year. And now at the death, the crucifixion of Jesus, that veil is ripped from top to bottom. The gates of heaven are opened. Everyone can see in. And Jesus is our high priest who goes into the presence of God saying, now, I've opened the way. You no longer have to be stuck in your little compartments. Because previous to this, brothers and sisters, if you're a Gentile, you can go to the Temple Mount. You can come up onto the, the platform of the Temple Mount, but you can't come within 500 cubits by 500 cubits. There's a little fence, a latticework called the Soreg, and there are 13 openings in the Soreg to get you into the court of the women. And next to each opening, there's a Greek and a Latin inscription according to Josephus that says basically, the translation being a, basically, Gentiles beware. If you pass this point, you're accountable for your own death. You're responsible because you will die. That was put there by the public affairs department of the day. Um, if you're a Gentile, that is as close as you can get to the presence of God. Jesus rending the veil breaks all of these down. If you're a woman, you can go into the court of the women, but you can't pass the Nicanor Gate. That's as far as you can go. If you're a man, you can't pass the one cubit high step into the court of the priests. That's as far as you can go. And if you're a priest, unless you got the assignment, you can't even go into the holy place. And if you are a priest and can go in the holy place, you can't pass the veil. Now Jesus has broken down all of those barriers in closing. Brothers and sisters, 
as we get excited about understanding history and, and lenses and views of Jesus in their original setting, let's not lose sight of the fact that if Matthew himself were here today, I don't think he would want us to focus on him or his audience and then leave it there. I think Matthew would look at us and say, I want you to know that Jesus is the Christ, that through the veil of his flesh, to use Paul's comparison, he has invited all to come into the presence of God. And as our church moves forward in time, I think you're sensing that this invitation is going to all. And by the way, it's no longer an invitation for just the earth. President Nelson said, our invitation is simple and it's sincere. We invite all of God's children on both sides of the veil to come unto their Redeemer, to partake and enjoy the blessings of the temple, to enjoy enduring joy, and to qualify for eternal life. That is my testimony that I add to Matthew's, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, a new Moses, but most importantly, the son of the of the eternal God, and I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.